feel like it's hard for you to communicate. Give me a little hand raised there or a hell yeah, or maybe a no. Maybe it's easy for you to communicate and you just want to see what else you can learn about communication. So um, do you ever have a hard or do you have a hard time feeling heard is another question. If that ever resonates for you in any relationship that you have, definitely give me a little hands up so I know what you're thinking. Um, why do so many of us feel that effective communication is so hard? What do you think about that one? Why do you think that it is such a common issue for so many of us to think that communication is difficult? Any ideas for anyone? I'll give you a second to write that your answers. Um, are you ready to learn how to communicate more effectively? I hope so. So for anyone who's still thinking about why it's so difficult to communicate, well, because most of us have not learned healthy communication styles. We haven't learned them. There is the macro chasm of the country that you're from. So some countries of origin are definitely better communicators than others, and some are less good at communicating. Um, you know, some places are against communicating emotions and some areas are very into communicating emotions. So you have that big, the culture, the macro culture of, you know, wherever you live. And then of course, and, and actually I didn't realize this, if you lived in Tokyo um, and you're talking about feelings, that's like a big faux pas, like that is not allowed at all. While in other places, we really want you to talk about feelings and some, like if you say, hi, how are you? Like in America, we're not really supposed to tell anybody how you actually are. Then we get thrown off for like, wait a minute, uh, that was just a rhetorical question. I don't really want to know how you're feeling. <laughs> so we've kind of been taught the whole time, like don't actually say what you're thinking. When we ask you questions, we don't really want to know what, you're, what you feel. So that's kind of been the culture that a lot of us have grown up in, no matter where we come from. And then of course, there's the microcosm, the, the family unit. So many people come from families where they never learned effective communication because they watch their parents or their caretakers not communicating effectively. If they tried to communicate, they were kind of smushed down and, and told that, that what they had to say didn't matter. And they never really learned what it was like to communicate in a healthy way. In fact, I remember as a, as a child, my parents arguing and I never ever got to see the resolution for it. I heard the arguing and the yelling and screaming and the doors slamming and, and all that kind of stuff. But I never actually got to see, like, how did they make things better? Like, how did they move on? Basically, what would happen is my dad would go into the, into the bedroom, my parents' bedroom. They'd close the door. There'd be some loud talking back and forth. And then dad would come out and be like, well, everything's okay now. And then we had to pretend like everything was fine. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have had something, maybe not exactly the same, but a lot of things where there was like a blow up, something happens, and then nothing is ever talked about. And that's the form of communication that a lot of people have learned. And we know all too well how unhealthy that type of communication is. So what is going on there? Well, there's so much about communication. I had to write down some like bullet points because there's just like, I could do a full semester teaching, you know, 24 hours a day talking about communication because there's just so much information. Um, but one of the things, number one, I'm gonna give you a, a bunch of tips, all right? So if you have a writing utensil, definitely write stuff down. If you're by a computer and you're good at, at typing and you wanna type it up, definitely type some notes down. Number one, people are apologetic for their feelings. So what does that mean? We're afraid to share our feelings. We're afraid that our feelings are wrong. So we don't share them. We're afraid that if we say it in a way, we're going to offend someone. And so we don't actually say what's on our minds. So we never get heard and we never feel understood. That's a big issue. And the thing is, is that we're worth it. It's important for us to share what's on our mind and what we're feeling with the people that we are surrounded by. And if we say something wrong, we shouldn't be worried about them running away. But a lot of us, that's what we've learned from growing up is that they're going to abandon me. They're going to leave me. Well, in a healthy, committed relationship and in a healthy relationship in general, the person's not going to run away because you said something they don't like. You're, there's going to be more communication that happens. So really being able to commu communicate and feel like your voice matters. That's something that's really important to keep in mind. Being quiet about something and not sharing what's on your mind is actually going to cause more issues. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. The next step or next tip, number two, figure out your feelings. Okay, so 
Um, and I see some people say, I need to speak up instead of freezing up and not saying a word. And this is perfect that you said that because the figuring out your feelings, I think, is a huge thing also. When we are upset, so, okay, so when I'm upset, a lot of times I don't know why. You know, so I'm like, okay. And I don't, I'm not a very emotional person. I don't get angry very easily. I don't get upset very easily. So if there's something bothering me, I know that it's something going on. So what I'll do is, for me, I, there's little cues that I have. And there's cues that you have too. You have to kind of figure out what they are. For me, the cues might be that um, like my jaw is clenching a little bit more or my, my neck is feeling a little bit tight or I have this like nagging feeling in my chest or like I keep thinking about something over and over again or you know any of those feelings and whenever I start having those things I sit down and I'm like okay what is it that's going on and I, I allow my body to tell me what it is and or and oh and this is another big one I snack do we ever do we ever snack on the healthy stuff normally not right so if I'm going in the closet and I'm looking for stuff to snack on and I'm like why am I eating like kind of quickly and I like I'm kind of nervous about something what is it so I sit down with all of those feelings and all of those signs and I figure out what the issue is. And sometimes I figure out right away, sometimes it takes me a day, normally not more than that, because once you really become in tune with your feelings, you start to really be able to figure, out, figure it out. Then the important thing is to share the feelings with the people that are important to you. So if it's something that's bothering you in a relationship, it's something that you need to say in the relationship. So when I was in my toxic relationship, there would be things that would come up and I would be so uncomfortable and so worried to share because I was worried about walking on eggshells. I was worried there was going to be a fight. I was worried that I was going to be told that my feelings didn't matter and, and all of those things that I kept a lot of things hidden. You know, I came a little bit secretive about things. Um, some might say shady, you know, because I would just I was afraid to say what was really on my mind. So I was like almost pretending to be someone that I wasn't and kind of quieting myself and acting like my feelings didn't matter. So those start kinds of things they actually start building up and all of those feelings that you have start building up and then when you actually share your feelings then you're blowing up you know then you're blowing up with the person so really making sure that we know what our feelings are and what's causing them so like for example let's say that you are really angry at someone such a popular thing to do right now with social media is to take your cell phone and start writing a text message or write an email or you know what, whatever it is thing you and get everything out and you say everything that you want to say in there and then bam you send it and then immediately after you send it you're like oh shit what did I do like almost instantly you feel badly for the fact that you sent this angry message because you were like all riled up so what you can do is is you can actually write that message but don't send it let it sit there Sometimes you sit, let it sit there for six hours. Sometimes just 20 minutes will work. Sometimes you need longer. Let it sit there. And when you start calming down and you say, hey, you know, I was kind of jumping down that person's throat because I had a bad day at work and I'm really stressed out because X, Y, Z is happening. I was upset with this person, but it came out a lot worse because I was already in an angry mood. Then you look back at that email and you're like, oh, okay, let me just get to the point or let me just not send anything at all. And then you leave it at that. But really being aware of what your feelings are and where they're coming from is going to be really helpful in effectively communicating with your partner or any relationship that you're in. The next one, uh, let's see, believe you matter. When we are in those toxic relationships, we start to feel this feeling that we don't matter, that our feelings don't matter. And we have insecurities that come up. And so, you know, again, we go back to that feeling of what exactly am I trying to communicate? You know, what is it that I'm trying to say? And so like, we'll say, oh, wait a minute. You know what? If I tell someone they're going to leave me or they're going to be angry with me, it really doesn't matter. I'm just going to suppress it. And then we're going back to suppressing of your emotions, which is going to end up in exploding, get, ending up like you feel like you're not heard. It's going to just end up you feeling really, really frustrated. And it's going to keep the relationship from actually blossoming. Because if you're not comfortable enough to share your feelings with the person that you're in a relationship with, then you don't get that level of intimacy in a relationship. 
You should be able to feel validated. You should be able to feel emotionally secure in sharing your feelings with your partner. If you're not feeling that, you really want to question why you're in that relationship. Why would you want to be with someone who is not treating you well and not listening to what you have to say and who minimizes what you have to say and tell, you know, and doesn't seem to care to make any changes if you do actually share something. So, you know, making sure that we are sharing what's on our minds. Yep. And I see some yeses. Um, sharing what's on our mind with the other person and just we can't control how they react to how we feel, but it's still our job to share the information. One of the things I say with my clients in my um, six week transformational group is, you know, when things feel uncomfortable, that's when it's time to say something. So when you're starting to feel that discomfort in your body and you're like, ooh, that, that feels a little bit uncomfortable. I, I've been thinking about something and it, it's kind of feeling uncomfortable. Whenever there's discomfort, Bam, that's when you share what it is. Now, if you're in the heat of the moment and there's like anger and things like that, you might need to take a break for a minute and think about it again, sometimes overnight or whatever. But if you're feeling like something has to be said in a relationship, wait for the right time and share it with a person that is you're having the issue with. Um, here's another one that's actually interesting. Sometimes we don't share it with other people because we've already made up in our heads a story of how the other person is going to react. Does that happen with anyone? Well, if I tell them my feelings, then they're going to get angry and they're going to leave me. Maybe that's happened to you before, so maybe that's a possibility. But again, a healthy relationship, that should not be what happens. In fact, if there is a healthy relationship, when you are sharing the information, it actually makes the relationship stronger. So for example, if I am friends with someone and they say one thing but mean something else, those are people I tend to avoid because I don't trust them. So as a healthy person, the people that I like to surround myself with are also healthy communicators. They're also people that are able and willing to share what's on their mind because it makes my life a hell of a lot easier. That way I don't have to try to figure out like when they said they want to hang out with me on Friday, did they really mean they want to hang out with me or were they just trying to be polite? I, I don't have time for that. You know, if I say something, I mean it. That's integrity. That's honesty. That's trusting yourself. All of those things are really important. When we're not living in integrity, when we're not trusting ourselves, when we're not trusting other people, the relationship is just not gonna work out. It's not a healthy relationship. And then it makes you anxious and nervous. So then you're like, okay, well, I don't really know what they mean and I don't really know what they're saying. They told me it's okay, they wanna bring me over food, but really they're telling everybody else that they're angry that they have to pay for dinner. You know, like, well, why do that to anyone? So most people, in fact, all the clients that I work with and all the people that I talk to uh, agree that they would rather be told honestly and be honestly communicated with than for someone to hold back and not say what's on their mind because then they feel uncomfortable and they don't really know what the person means or what their expectations are. So it actually, and this is interesting, instead of making the relationship easier, it makes the relationship more difficult. Because then you're both trying to figure out what the other one needs and wants and what they really mean. And then that becomes really uncomfortable because you're not really trusting each other to be honest and open with whatever's going on for you. All right, which brings us to the next tip. Being assertive. Communicating assertively. Using I statements. Has anyone ever heard that one before? Assertive communication? hopefully a bunch of you, um, it goes along with boundaries as well. And I'm not going to go into like major details on boundaries, but boundaries, assertive communication, they go hand in hand. One goes into the other one. In fact, they, they can almost be used interchangeably a lot of times. But people who are assertive are people who have confidence. They feel good about themselves. They know what they want. They know what their feelings are. They're able to share in a productive way with the people that they are communicating with. Someone who's aggressive is going to be in your face. They're not going to listen. They might point. They might put their body in, into you. They're going to try to um, take over the conversation. They're going to point out every fault they possibly can and try to win the conversation. That's someone who's more aggressive. Someone who's passive, which a lot of us as codependents, what will, what will tend to happen with codependents is we go from passive, 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 passive till we blow up, become really aggressive. 
And then it's like, oh, pass. And then you feel bad for being really aggressive. So then it's back to being passive again. Well, passive is, is letting someone walk all over you. The reason why you blow up is because you haven't felt heard in so long. So you're like, well, they should know that I was upset about, you know, them not inviting me to the party on Friday, but you know, they never told, they never told me about it. And, and I feel really bad. Well, that's passive because how could the person know how you feel if you didn't share with them? So passive communication is going to be really ineffective, just like aggressive communication, because it doesn't allow anyone to really feel heard and it doesn't really, you know, there's no interaction back and forth. Assertive communication uses I statements. It's direct. It sticks to the point. It's not accusatory. So as soon as someone starts saying, you know, you did this, you made me feel this, this is what happened. It's really putting it all on the other person and not taking any responsibility for yourself, which makes the other person feel defensive. And you know, if you've ever been in that situation where someone's been more aggressive towards you, you know, they haven't been very assertive. If someone's aggressive towards you right away, there's the defensive. So then it's like, Ooh, do I react? Do I not react? Then you might have the heart pounding in your chest. You might feel uncomfortable. But that kind of communication just doesn't, doesn't work with aggressiveness. So assertive communication really makes sure that you are fact-based. So you're really keeping it clear on what it is that you're looking to talk about. And you have to keep in mind when you're, when you're communicating, it's like a tennis match, right? So it goes back and forth. And there should be you know, a little bit of talking, a little bit of talking, maybe some clarifying questions, some nodding, some ahas. Some, okay, I get it. Did you mean this when you said this? I'm not really sure I understand. You know, and it goes, it goes back and forth. If it's one person talking the whole time, what is it, a lecture series? <laughs> you know, who wants to be lectured about anything? You feel more part of the solution to the problem if we use I communication. I need your help. I feel that... I was hurt by what you said. In the future, I would really like for you to let me know that there's a party going on because I really would like to go even though you might think I don't because I've got so much on my plate. There we go. That's a really good, easy thing. The fact was they weren't invited to a party. The feelings were hurt and even maybe abandonment or loneliness, you know, whatever those feelings were, if, you're, if you know who you are and what the actual feelings were. But what, what were the feelings? And then what, what would you want in the future? In the future, I would still like to be invited. Even if I can't make it to the party, I would like to still be invited because it makes me feel included. And, you know, and really let them know what, what your feelings are. That it, it keeps there from being hurt feelings and defensiveness. I was, I was talking to a client um, not that long ago who was telling me about her birthday. And she was saying to me, you know, Stephanie, nobody invited me to do anything for my birthday and I'm so hurt and nobody ever remembers me. And, you know, we, we were talking about it and I said, well, did you tell anybody that you, that you wanted to do something for your birthday? And she was like, no, I didn't. And I said, well, how did you expect anyone to know that you wanted to do something? Some people want to do nothing for their birthdays. Some people already have plans and don't really want to include everybody on their birthdays. Everyone's kind of got different communication about their birthdays. So you can't just expect people to know what you want. You know, and then I shared with her, you know, for my, for my 40th, I didn't even, I didn't wait for anyone. I let everyone know that I was going to have an Alice in Wonderland birthday party. And, and I was Alice and I said, everyone's dressing up as Alice in Wonderland theme. And bam, I prepared my own party. I didn't feel badly that I was preparing my own party. I was excited to share with everyone, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is fun and exciting. And so people knew what the expectation was. Well, we're going to go to Stephanie's party and she wants us dressed up as one of the Alice in Wonderland themed people. Okay, done and done. You know, so... It's, it's a very different thing. What you're, you're assertively communicating what you want. I want everyone to be dressed as Alice in Wonderland. We're going to have a tea party. And the other one is, nobody's inviting me anywhere. Nobody wants to hang out with me. That's the victim mentality. But the problem is, is a lot of times people don't know that the other person wants something. You know, that everyone is really busy in their own lives. You know, you, ha you have to really kind of keep that in mind. Everyone's busy during their own thing. And everyone's got their own stuff that they're dealing with. You know, when there is communication, you have to remember that communication is coming from all of the experiences the person has ever had in their life. So there are triggers that you might never know about. There are things that are happening to that person that day that you have no idea what happened to them. 
So the assertive communication really kind of helps it stick to the point and talk about what's going on right there, where, where the other stuff is like, you know, it can so easily be misread and misunderstood based on your own background, based on the experiences that you have had, because we can only live through the eyes that we see through, you know, which is, which is why when people, you know, get really angry and frustrated with other people, it's not always about the other person. We really have to look within and, you know, in our six week transformational group, that's one of the things we really focus on is really, really looking within to look and see like, Hey, what's going on? What's the commonality of things that I've experienced that I can, you know, change, ameliorate, make better and actually make it so that I can communicate in a more effective way and have my life be better. So it kind of all goes together. All right. The next one, practice good listening skills. All right. Some of you, I'm sure, you know those good, effective listening skills. You do the nodding, you do the ahas, you, you do all those, those things. You know when people are not actively listening, right? Because they're looking at their cell phone, their eyes kind of glaze over, you know, all of those things are going on. So really making sure that we are looking at the communication skills and looking at the body language. Like, is this person not interested? Are they not, is this not the right time to have this conversation? then that's something to keep in mind as well. So look for those cues that you're having, the nonverbal cues. If you're an empath like me, I can get like the sensations of pe people. It's like I can feel their energy coming out at me and it's like, ooh, okay, they're feeling a little bit uncomfortable or they're feeling like, you know, they're tired or, you know, whatever. And I I've learned that it's not about me, it's about what they're feeling at that time. So being able to differentiate what we're feeling versus what the other person is feeling it's really important to be able to notice because it is, it's not all about us. You know, when it's a relationship, it's about two people communicating. <sighs> the next tip, never assume that anyone can read your mind. My husband, David, and I know each other better than anyone. I can't really think of that many other people. Maybe my best friend, Brooke, knows me close to as well. But we know each other pretty well. And there are so often times where I'll be like kind of, thinking something in my head and he'll answer it out loud or there'll be a song in my head and he starts singing it. And we're like, how the hell did you do that? You know, so we are really well connected. I still cannot read his mind. There is way too often where we assume people know things that they can't know because they're not in our mind. Sometimes we say, well, they looked at me in a certain way and I knew that they understood what I was saying. Not necessarily because again, go back to all the history of what they've experienced. They might have been thinking of something completely different when they nodded their head and looked at you. You don't really know what they were thinking. One of the, the biggest issues that I've ever had has been, you know, in not sharing and not communicating with my partners. And that was even in unhealthy relationships and even in healthy relationships with friends, with family, with, with people that you care about. Assuming that people know what you're thinking is going to be a recipe for disaster. That is not going to work out in a productive way when we think other people are mind readers. So make sure that we share what is on our minds. And then the last tip specifically I want to talk about is don't try to fix the other person. If you're in, a, if you're in an unhealthy relationship and part of your communication style is trying to explain to the person that you're with, why they should change, why what they did was wrong, how they should really be, fixing, manipulating, doing any of those things with another person is going to not work. Remember how hard it is to fix yourself. It's hard work. It's hard work with the with a therapist and a coach and, and working on it every day. It is painful, it is uncomfortable, it is not easy work. That's when you want to do the work. Now imagine trying to force someone to change. So if part of your communication in your current relationship is constantly trying to make the other person be something that they're not, you're wasting your breath. They, sh they show you who they are in the acts that they do. If they're cursing at you, if they're screaming at you, if they're threatening you, if they are not supportive, if they are not validating, if they are not... Those are all things that might just be who they are. If you've communicated with them how you feel and what you need and they don't seem to care about any of those things, 
then that says a lot about the relationship. And I really, I just actually had a conversation with a, uh, a new client today. And, you know, and I was saying that it's, it's so interesting because, you know, we, we get stuck into it. We're like, well, maybe this time they'll understand that I really mean it this time. You know, you, th you do the dance of you throw them out and then you let them back in and then you throw them out and you let them back in. You say this time it's a but it doesn't. It doesn't change anything. It's always the same patterns over and over again. And it, it doesn't, sometimes it's not even an abusive relationship. Sometimes you're, in fact, this happens very often. You're both wonderful people. You just might not work together. You might not communicate effectively together. So trying to force it when it's not happening naturally is going to make it so that neither one of you are happy. You're both going to be trying to be something that you're not. You're going to keep trying to explain to the other person how they should behave, what they should do. And who wants to listen to that? I don't want to be nagged all the time on how someone else thinks I should behave and what I should do. That's terrible. You know, and, and we again, we'll talk about another time boundaries, but boundaries are not really because we're trying to be in control of the other person. Boundaries are so that we're in control of ourselves. What's okay for me? Because any of these communication styles, anything that has to do with communication is the, the, the beginning part of it is being healthy and having a healthy mind frame to begin with. If we are not sure about ourselves, if we are not comfortable with who we are, if we are not confident, if we don't know what our values are, if we don't know what we're looking for in a partner, how are we expecting to find that in a partner? And then how are we expecting that partner to know what that is? If we don't even know who we are, how are we expecting anybody else to do that? So, and then how are we expecting to attract another healthy partner? So there's a lot of different things. If we are not healthy to begin with, we are not gonna be able to communicate effectively. We're not going to attract the right partner. And then communication is never gonna be healthy. There's gonna be a lot of miscommunication over and over again. It's become very, very frustrating. So really learning how, who you are, what your expectations are, what your values are, what you need in a relationship, getting really comfortable sitting in this and just being alone with you helps with effective communication. Being alone, knowing who you are is an integral part of communicating effectively. So, uh, you know, one of the things that, that's really hard for people is they're like, okay, well, I know I'm not a very good communicator. I'm more of an introvert. And it, it's true that if you are an extrovert, it is a little bit easier to communicate, but it doesn't mean that all extroverts are good communicators. Um, it doesn't mean that all introverts are bad communicators, but there is definitely, it's a little bit easier for extroverts to communicate. Um, I've definitely had some times where I haven't communicated effectively. I'm more of an extrovert. My husband is more of, of an introvert. So what do I mean by extrovert? Well, I get energy by being around people. So, and not like the draining people, like people that I get, like if there's a fun party and there's, there's people that I, that I get along well with, I get energized from that. My husband, David, who's a musician and, and you know, very um, communicative and likes to hang out with people and stuff like that, he hangs out with people and he actually will start to feel drained. It actually drains him. So it's, it's interesting how we kind, of, we kind of found each other. And one of the things that we have found in our relationship is that because we have learned how to communicate effectively with each other in the beginning, I was someone who I'm very direct, I wanna figure out a solution, and then I want it to be over. And I wanna keep talking about it until it's done. With David, he needs time to focus and think about what he's going to say and what the issue is. So one of us will bring up a problem, we'll talk about it, then we kind of let it go. And from what he said, he said, I need sometimes a day to talk about it, to like think about it. And so we figured out, you know, if it's at night, then the next day we come back to it and we discuss it the next day. So that way he's had time to process. He can figure out where he's coming from, what the emotions are, and then he can share it with me. Not weeks worth of not communicating, but people need sometimes 24 hours. And that's okay. That's part of all healthy communication. But again, giving that back and forth, coming from a healthy place to begin with, is really going to help your communication with your partner and future healthy relationships. So, does anybody have any questions about communication? I want to be able to answer any questions that people have. And of course, you know, this is, this is one of those things, and please ask away, you know, don't feel bad, I'll go back and answer whatever questions. 
But, you know, in our six week intensive group, we actually talk about communication. So if, if communication has been an issue for you in the past where you've had issues communicating, then the group would be something that would be very helpful for you if you never want to have issues communicating again. If you really want to get down into it and figure out how to better communicate and you want to be able to feel heard and feel understood in relationships, then the six week transformational group is definitely going to be for you because that's one of the things that we work on. So you never have to worry about that again. You can definitely, and, and again, you'll just be adding to healthier relationships and more cohesive relationships as you get stronger in your ability to communicate your feelings. Your feelings are valid. They are important. They matter. And you should be with someone who agrees with that. There should be a partnership of people that you care about what they have to say. They care about what you have to say. And then back and forth. And there is that tennis match of conversation back and forth. So if it's something that you're looking to work on and get better at, then definitely send me a message because it's definitely the right group for you. Um, and if it's not something that you're ready to work on or interested in working on, then you know obviously stay in the regular group and you know ask your questions there. But if you're looking for, for actual change and daily support in changing things that are unhealthy, then definitely something that you'd be interested in. So make sure you send me a message. So what other questions are there? Let me just see if I, I know it. there was some questions that I didn't get to go back on. Hello to everyone who is watching. Kelsey, I'm glad you were able to come on and, and get something out of this. Um, all right, there was a bunch of people that said stuff in the beginning, so let me just go back. Um, yeah, so Melanie said that probably due to past and what I've seen and experienced, so a lot of people, their communication skills are definitely based on their past and, and people that the unhealthy people that they have also communicated with so, you know, again, you have two people that don't know how to communicate, trying to communicate with each other, disaster. And then we wonder why there's so much arguing and why there's so many people that are just like beyond frustrated because they don't feel like they're heard because you're not feeling heard because the other person is not listening to you and you might not be sharing what your feelings and you're expecting the other person to just understand what you're saying. And the other person is like, what's wrong with you? You know, and it's like, it just keeps going back and forth. So it just be, it's like a cycle that doesn't, you know, no one ever gets heard. So definitely past experience is a big one. Um, Cheryl said, I need to speak up instead of freezing up and not saying a word. Yep. Yep. Not saying anything, you know, again, for me as a healthy person, trying to read someone's mind when they say, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, I, I find that a lot of the times with women who are past their 50s, um, and it's not, I'm not saying that that's all women. I'm just saying I'm finding that it's more common. And I think it was, it was something that people were brought up with. And women in general, I still think are kind of brought up this way still to this day, is that we have to take care of everyone and we have to pretend like everything is okay. So, you know, it's like we're the ones in charge of the household. We have to do all these different things. And when people say, hey, how are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm fine. When you're like, I'm stressed out. I don't know. I haven't slept in three days. I am exhausted. My husband has been not helpful. The kids are screaming. You know, there's, there might be all these other things, but we have to pretend like everything is okay. And again, very detrimental to our health. In fact, there was a study done. Um, there was a Yale professor that did this study and they were looking at emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence actually is correlated to living a longer life. So people who live to 100 have a higher emotional intelligence. So what does that mean? Well, emotional intelligence means they can understand their feelings, they're able to communicate effectively what they're thinking and feeling. So they journal, they write, whatever they feel like writing, they share their story. They don't let anything build up. And then people that have cancer, people that have PTSD, people that have experienced stressful event, other stressful events in their lives, they all have better results if they have higher emotional intelligence. So being able to communicate their feelings will lead you to better health, less stress, and of course make you live longer. Because when I was in my stressful toxic, unhealthy relationship, I had back issues. I had bursitis in my shoulder. I had polycystic ovarian syndrome. I had um, rhinoids, so I couldn't feel the tips of my fingers. Um, I had just all of these different things that like just kept popping up and there were people were, the doctors were like, oh, it's stress related. Oh, it's this, oh, it's that. Yes. Well, miraculously, all of those things went away when I left my toxic relationship. 
So I am, you know, real true example of how lack of communication and not having my voice heard was directly causing my body to not work correctly. Once I left, every, things just got so much better all, all around me. You know, life, I began, everything just seemed brighter and better, but my health turned around. You know, I had a blood clot in my arm and, you know, and it was really strongly related to stress, the high, high levels of stress that I was feeling. And, you know, probably would have shortened my life by a lot, by a lot of years. So, you know, I'm the oldest I am now and the healthiest I've ever been. And so during those years, that was really wearing me down, that stress of not being able to be who I was, feeling like I had no voice, pretending like I had to be someone I wasn't because I was walking on eggshells. That takes away who we are and really adds a lot of stress. Um, let me see what other questions there are. Um, Anne said, I hold on to everything until I overflow in an emotional mess and my feelings get lost in that. And, and that's what happens a lot of times with my clients. And that's one of the things that I talk about with them is, you know, we hold it in, we hold it in, we hold it in and then pfft, it explodes. Well, if you think about like one of those pressure cookers and I'm, you know, I don't know if they have newer versions of pressure cookers nowadays, but the ones that I grew up with and the ones I know, they're the ones that they have those tops and you screw them on really tight. And then there's that little whistling sound thing that's on the top. I'm sure there's a, you know, proper wordings for all of these things, but this is how I'm describing it. <laughs> so there's that little thing that, that lets all the steam out. Well, before you undo the sides, you've got to let that steam out. If not, if you just undo the sides, it can pop off and hit you in the face. I've never seen it happen, but that's always what I was told. And, and we know that that is, that, you know, just by physics and whatever, we know that that's what's going to happen. So that's really what happens with our emotions. If we allow ourselves to feel the emotions when they come about, we share the emotions when they come about, then it doesn't, we don't explode. I used to never cry. I remember, you know, years going by and not crying. Now, like I'll, I'll hear, you know, someone say something nice to each other or like in my healing group and someone does something awesome. And I, and I immediately, I, I feel the tears come up. You know, I, I, if I'm talking to my husband about something, you know, emotional, I feel the emotion right away, but then it's gone. It's over instead of it building up and having to pretend like everything is okay. So allowing it to slowly just dissipate, just as it comes up, be very aware, like, oh, my jaw's hurting. Oh, my, my heart's beating a little chest or hard in my chest, or I'm feeling a little bit of tightness. Those are signs that something isn't right. Okay, I gotta figure it out. Oh, okay, I feel like, you know, I need to communicate this with my partner or, or something's going on at work or, you know, whatever it is. But really getting to know your body and know when it feels uncomfortable, that is a sign that your body is telling you, you need to share your thoughts and feelings. You need to share whatever is going on. Think of your emotions like, uh, like data in a computer. You know, they like, do like the zeros and ones and it, it makes up different pictures and stuff like that. Your body is telling you when there is a problem by the different sensations that you have. So listen to those sensations, feel them and say, oh, that's what, that's what anger feels like. That's what anxiety feels like. And start practicing the right words. You know, what is, I'm angry. Okay, well, are you really angry or do you feel alone? Do you feel dissatisfied? Do you feel misunderstood? Start really trying to put the right word with the feeling that you're having. And that way also too, just being able to verbalize it with the right words will help release some of the frustrations and anxiety and some of the stressors that you're feeling. All right, let me see what else. Good, I got some heck yeses. All right, awesome. Um, any tips on getting past the uncomfortable feeling that prohibits a person from sharing their feelings? Yes, here is the tip. It's gonna hurt and be uncomfortable. <laughs> the tip is do it anyway. In fact, that uncomfortable feeling is when I know that I have to share something. That's the, that's the way that I know how, how to do it. When I start thinking about something and I'm like, ooh, I really don't wanna do that. You know, I'm, I'm a landlord, I'm, I'm a coach, I'm a mom, I'm all these different things. And there are times I, I just, I have this feeling and I'm like, ooh, I just, I don't, I don't wanna have this conversation. I know it's gonna upset the other person or I'm not even really sure how to say it. And I have all these feelings that's my defense mechanism it's, it's the fear that's coming into my body. So all of these things of why I shouldn't do it, that's exactly when I know that's exactly what I have to do. Because if I don't, it's going to sit and fester. 
And as soon as I say it, I might feel my heart beat a little bit faster. I might feel that, uncom that uncomfortable, that discomfort in my, in my stomach or in my head sometimes. You know, I feel all those feelings, but you act in spite of the fear every time. When you're in an unhealthy relationship and you need to get out, it's going to be scary. You act in spite of the fear. When there's something that's on your mind and you really want to share it and you know you have to and it's uncomfortable, you act in spite of the fear. And that's when, when you know you're healthy is that that fear is there and it's healthy to feel it and it's there to protect you because your brain doesn't know the difference between real fear and imagined fear. So there's that fear of all that other history that's gone on, but you're an adult. And that discomfort might have been from childhood, from not being heard before, from all of those things. But you need to say, hey, okay, I see you. I see you, all those things, all those feelings, all those negative things. I deserve to be heard. I need to share what's on my mind. I have to share that feeling. And you're going to notice sometimes the pendulum swings in the other direction, you know, so it's like you're like way sharing. And then, you know, things start to get a little bit more normal once you start getting more used to it. You know, when I was first going through my divorce and I was in a depression and things were bad and things were starting to get better. So that was just like this, the pendulum started swinging where I was coming out of my depression and things were starting to get better. And people would say, how are you today? You having a good day? I'd be like, no, I feel pretty terrible. I can't breathe. I haven't slept in four days. I'm feeling pretty awful. You know, people would be like, whoa, like <laughs> afraid to like ask me how I was doing. And then as time went on, and I was able to just share it and just, even though it was uncomfortable to say what my feelings were, but I'm just gonna go do it and go for it, you know, jump in a pool with both of your feet. And then after a while, it was like, all right, things are pretty good, you know, or I'm a little bit stressed out, but, but overall things are, are going really well. And then I sort of was able to, a little, you know, be a little bit less, you know, like, I'm really feeling terrible. You know, I was able to kind of tone it down a little bit and be like more the pendulum swinging just a little bit lower instead of it being like, whoa, you know, sharing, sharing a little bit too much. So you learn, you know, you, you start learning, but I would really suggest, um, there's a few things that you can do. Definitely suggest in, um, in count counseling or therapy to share communication styles, like do like a little one-on-one -on -one conversation with your therapist and just share it. Um, as a coach, that's something that I do all the time. You know, we can, we can have a little conversation and, and share, you can practice, you can write it out. You know, sometimes when, um, I had a client just recently had to have a difficult conversation with their, uh, mother and father. So, you know, we talked about it. I wrote out an idea of an outline of what they could share and then they use their own words, but use the outline to share with their, with their parents so that they were able to use more effective communication. So you can definitely do that. Um, and that'll help as well. And yeah, acting spite and fair, that is definitely a huge one. And in fact, if you're, if things are never scary, then you're probably never growing. So, you know, sometimes things, if I haven't been scared in a long time and everything's been super easy, I know I need to push myself a little bit. So, you know, and again, that discomfort, it's there for a reason, listen to it, see what's going on and then learn from it. All right. What other questions do we have? Communication, and I, there's lots and lots of communication stuff. So what else do we have? And, and you know, really, realistically, whether you're communicating with your partner, with a parent, you know, with a, a work person, it's still really about assertive communication. It's allowing the other person to feel heard and to feel heard yourself. I mean, that that's still really, I don't care if it's in business, I don't care if it's at home, you know, sometimes we're the worst communicators with the people we love the most, or we expect people to act a certain way with people that we love the most. And that's not necessarily a fair thing. You know, sometimes too, there's also a history. So, um, you know, sometimes we like we're acting or reacting to something someone is saying when that's not what they meant in that instance. We're kind of reacting to something they said maybe five years ago or last week. And we're automatically in reaction mode because it's because it's them because we know them for so long. Um, what I do with, for example, like even my parents, you know, I love them to death. Mom can be difficult at times, but what I try to really do is I listen for the feeling. So you know, if there's something going on, if she's cranky, or you know, be like, oh, nobody comes to visit me, and you know, nobody cares about me, and whatever. Then I'll respond with something like, I'm so sorry that you feel so alone. I wish that you had more support. 
you know, and I, and I wait, it's, it's not about me it, or I'm sorry. It sounds like you miss me. And you know, I'm, it's, it stinks that we're, that we live so far away from each other, but it's, it really seems that you miss me or that you feel missing you feeling alone, feeling abandoned. Those are, those are big things that parents have in relationships. People have those things and realizing where those emotions are coming from. Again, not expecting to read anyone's mind, but sometimes you can tell like if it's a parent, some, you know, kind of typical parent things is missing you, um, wanting to be a part of their life and feeling alone because they want their kids around, you know, that's a typical thing, not all parents, but that's a typical thing, you know, in, in a relationship, abandonment, guilt, shame, some of those things are kind of common ones. Um, so kind of think about what some of those commonalities are. Um, Dana said, any tips for communicating with a narcissist? I have to co-parent with my ex and this can be a challenge. Well, remember that narcissists are always going to be about them and they're never going to be at fault. So you always want to keep that in mind. The biggest thing that I'm going to recommend to you is limit any conversations with them as much as possible. Um, if you can get the app, we actually have the, um, I think it's called Family App. Um, you might want to speak to your lawyer and find out if there's one that they recommend. But there, there are apps that you can use where you can communicate through text message only with the parent that you have to co-parent with. And it kind of forces them to be a little bit nicer because of the fact that everything they write in that message can be used against them in court. So I would definitely recommend that, but don't communicate with them in any other way because they're always going to blame you. They're going to try to make you responsible for everything bad that's ever happened in the relationship. Anything that's, that's not working correctly with your child, it's gonna be all your fault. Um, and they might be causing the problems. So, you know, a narcissist is never going to admit that they're wrong. It's always about them and it's always about them being perfect and, and wonderful and you being at fault and you doing something wrong. And so you're just going to kind of waste your time, waste your effort. So don't, don't feel personally responsible for their behavior. Know that their behavior is on them, their frustrations, their anger, everything that's coming out and it's seeming like it's at you, it's all related to them. So don't get sucked into their drama. You, you can control your own emotions. You're responsible for you. They're responsible for them. And, there, and that's a really good question because you know there are things that happen in these toxic relationships where you might be like, oh my God, I screamed and yelled and lost my temper and did all these things. And it's the person might have done all these terrible things, but it's you allowed them to push you to such a place that you overreacted, you exploded because you've been putting it up with it, putting up with it for so long. So, you know, it's the other person is behaving the way that they are and that's bad, but you need to be responsible for yourself and your reaction to how they are. So just realize where it's coming from and know that you can't fix it or change it, but you still need to be responsible for you and you can remove yourself if you need, if you need to. Um, okay, I've tried to get him to use an app and he won't. Well, then how is he communicating with you? If, because here, here's the thing. If with the lawyer, you say to the lawyer, you know, I need to communicate through an app because I'm not comfortable communicating with him in any other way. And you say to him, I'm only communicating with this way. Then that's the only way you can communicate. Because if you've blocked him from everywhere else, then there's really no way that he can communicate. If he shows up at your house unannounced, then you call the police. I mean, there's, there's ways to make them accountable to follow through with what you need them to follow through. And if that can be, if it's court mandated, sometimes courts mandate it. So I would speak to your lawyer. If you have not spoken to your lawyer about it, then do so tomorrow. Um, I don't know where you are, or what time it is for you, but for us it's later. So do so tomorrow and really let them know, I am not comfortable speaking to them on the phone. I do not want to email. I don't want them coming to my house. The only way I can communicate is through the app. And then they'll really have no choice because you will block them from any other possibility. And if they are finding a way to get through anything else, you ignore. Gray rock. You do not respond. You do not interact with someone who's trying to manipulate you. Because that's what you need to remember. They're trying to manipulate you. So hopefully that helps. Dana, let us know tomorrow in the group. Uh, maybe in, in the comments, let us know if you were able to communicate with your lawyer and um, tell us what your lawyer says, because that's definitely something they should not, wh there's, there's like Yoda, right? There's do and not do, no try. So you're either 
saying, hey, you can't communicate with, communicate with me in any other way than this app, and then blocking them from everything else, or you're allowing them to communicate. So you do not have to have any conversations with them if they are not using the app that has been directed for them to use. Period. The end. And that's, you know, and again, that's confidence. That's, that's really sticking to your guns, knowing that you're right and you're doing the wrong, the right thing is going to help you really stay in your, in yourself and feel confident and strong to stick up for yourself. Because again, your feelings matter and it's important for you to feel heard. And right now he's obviously not doing that by not listening to you, not validating and not, you know, not being supportive of your wants, which I'm sure that was the issue in the entire relationship.